to the stage. Talking about leadership in a world of emerging technologies, please welcome from University of Derby, Richard J. Self. Round of applause, please. three little parts. One, a little bit about leadership, and then a look at some of the currently very much hyped emerging technologies that everybody's telling us we ought to be using for all sorts of very good reasons. And then I want to finish off with just six questions, the six W's. It will help you to demythologize all of the hype from the marketeers of all of these new technologies. The questions that they really, really, really don't want you to ask because you will then see through their sales pitch. Because many of these uh, sales pitches are far worse than the worst sales pitch from the worst used car salesman you can imagine. And we know how much we trust used car salesmen. But the technologies I'm going to look at today, the salesmen are not even worse in many respects than the used car salesman. And those six questions are going to help you to understand what they're really on about. But first, leadership. We know that there are fundamentally two roles once you get above the doing role of the staff. You've got the supervisor managerial levels, then you've got the executive and leadership roles. It's not to say that you can't be a leader at a junior level, you can. But it's disentangling what leadership means from what management is. I'm interested today in the leadership side. 
Yeah, management is all about organizing stuff and people and things and money and resources and timescales and getting it done. It's kind of like the shepherd here herding from behind, rounding up the sheep with the assistance of a few sheepdogs to make them all go in the kind of right direction. Most in business, it's like she herding, sh uh, shepherding sheep from behind. It's not quite like as bad as at university, where it's more like trying to herd cats, which is, as we all know, is virtually impossible. They all go over there. But are you a manager organising? You know what's got to be done. You know where they've got to go. Or a slightly different version of the sheep. the shepherd leads from the front, finding the next pasture. And many of you will recognize the following phrase. My sheep know my voice, they follow me. I might have got it the wrong way around, but you know where that comes from. Do your staff, does your company follow you because of who you are, what you say, your attitude, your ethics? A manager will talk about the how. I want this river crossed with a bridge, go fix. say, I want to cross the river. What is the best way across that river? Because depending on the circumstances, you might want a pontoon bridge, you might want a ferry, you might want a boat, you might want a suspension bridge. I don't know. Leaders set the task as a direction. Let the teams figure out the best way to, of the how. And with all of those technologies that we're going to look at today, they are being sold to us. This is the technology which is guaranteed to solve your business problems, whether it's AI or neural networks, Natural language processing, chatbots, AI, pattern recognition, image recognition, etc., etc. Oh, and blockchain. They will solve your business. You don't need to worry about the business problem definition, the requirement specification. Just get our technology and it will solve it. Now, I've had so much experience being involved in many of these. Approaches, not the technologies themselves, but the approaches to getting technology implemented. That I am a skeptic. I will say to these people, prove it. Answer these questions. I don't go so far as to be a skeptic, a cynic, sorry, who says, I just don't believe it's not going to work. I at least give them the opportunity to prove that they do understand is more than just technology. That we, as implementers, we, the purchasers of this technology, need to think deeply about not just the technology, but the business requirement, the business problems that need to be solved. Whether it's in supply chain management and quality, blockchain is the answer, apparently. But possibly not. There's some questions to be asked. And you, as the leaders, need to know the questions that your team have to ask once they get through to the final level of what technologies shall we use once I know what the business problem is, what I need to know what the solution should be. Don't give me technologies first. We learned that in the 1970s, that getting technology because it had big blue on the outside and we had it back in the 1970s, buying Big Blue at IBM. It was great. You couldn't get fired for that. But you 
might not find that technology, the technology was actually terribly useful for you. Because you bought it as technology, as a solution waiting for a problem to occur. So ask questions, be skeptical, do not be cynical. You see, the problem is, as the Standish Group have been telling us now in the chaos reports every year or two years since 1994, IT projects are not actually terribly successful. When they started, they were talking about projects which were successful on time to budget and uh, met the contracted force um, requirements and functionality. And of course, there were the failures, 20 odd percent ish, and the rest in between, what they call challenged. Late over budget and only delivering part of the functionality. Typically about 40% of the functionality, which becomes a problem when you realize that modern IT systems are designed around the Pareto principle will deliver the 20% of the functionality that delivers 80% of the workload. So I now deliver only 40% of the functionality that was contracted for and I deliver 5% of the actual functionality that my staff have been using for years. That causes your staff serious problems of stress, amongst other things. And they have to find workarounds which corrupt your databases, which we'll see about, talk about in the next slide. Now the CIOs who provided all the data about project success and resolution bitched quite reasonably that said on the grounds that, well, you know, these are long projects, typically three to five years, the world moves on, requirements probably change, so you can't hold us to that one, but we would like to be held to account for delivering business value. So by 2013 or thereabouts, so the standard group said, okay, yeah, we're here, we'll do, we'll do that, make that switch. The CIOs obviously thought that this would increase the success rate. Just to help calibrate that change, they were then asked to backtrack for the previous two years, 2011 and 12. And as you can see from the purple and the blue lines, on time to budget delivering business value is actually even less successful than on time to budget delivering the functionality. see a lot of nodding heads as though you've never seen that set of data before. It's a very sobering thought, isn't it, that we are so unsuccessful with our projects in generating business value for our organisations. What is even more worrying about that is that last blue number at the end, the 30%, against the old definition on time to budget and functionality, what had risen over the many years to as high as 39% had crashed down to 30% by 2017. I could do another whole talk about that and some of the factors are going into this lack of success. The problem is the consequences of that failure, or that level of failure. One of the, the most extreme estimates of the costs of all of the failures we have about our IT, whether security failures or the fact that our systems aren't joined up enough and maybe RPA, this robotics thing that uh, we talk about today, may well help a bit, is to connect between systems which aren't connected at the moment. We waste, on a recent survey, 30% of about 60% of all office workers, 30% of their time is wasted just moving data from one system to another. Add all of that lot up, and the overall costs of using all of this broken, disconnected IT is about six trillion US dollars a year, and we only spend three trillion dollars a year creating the stuff and implementing it and running it. And that's 9% roughly of the world GDP. So our IT systems are so inefficient that they are costing us a tenth or thereabouts of world GDP. We need to do something a lot better. 
What compounds the problem is not only have we got broken systems, but we've also got a problem with all of our data. John Easton from IBM back in 2012 produced this chart, suggesting that something like 80% of all of the data we have around us is of uncertain veracity. In other words, not that it's wrong, but we have no easy way or no quick way of identifying whether that data is true or false, or by how much it is in error. Some of you, maybe quite a few of you, who have implemented major systems upgrades or changes of systems to ERP systems. And we spend probably six, eight months with data cleansing exercises to cull all the uncertain data, the unnecessary data that's cluttering up our database before we go live. You've been there, I can see. Probably an even more. Yeah, nearly 100%, yeah. And the interesting thing is you think, hey, we've got a clean database now. We'll be okay. And within five years or less, you have to start the data cleansing exercise again because when you implemented your ERP system, you only implemented 20% of the functionality that the users have. Yes, I know that other 80% is only used 20% of the time and it's used once or twice a year. Because it's not there, the world hasn't changed and won't go away and say, no problem. The world has continues to have its requirements. And so they shoehorn the data in, in random sorts of ways that messes up your, the clarity of your database. So you cannot trust your management decision-making analysis. All this magical AI and analytics which is now being sold to us to understand what we should do with our predictive analytics, it's contaminated by large amounts of data we don't actually know whether it's right or wrong. It affects all of these technologies that Bernard Marr mentioned on Monday. By the way, this is a brand new presentation. It's never been seen before today. I wrote it on Monday because it seems so opposite to the top topic of this um, conference. Six technologies there that are supposed to be the things that Bernard Marr was saying in his Forbes magazine. These are the tech trends in 2020 that everybody must prepare for. Yes, everybody needs to skeptically ask a lot of very deep questions about these technologies. AI, vision recognition, pattern matching, the stuff that's under, behind all sorts of things, cars, auto, autonomous vehicles and so on, smart weaponry. The top one was magical. The smart munitions organization in the military for the Americans, was trying to come up with smart munitions who could recognize the difference between a friendly and a um, uh, foe tank. Did the normal things of training, were passed perfectly. Until someone accidentally tried something different and discovered that that vision system had no idea that it was supposed to be learning about tanks. All it had learned about was the background because unfortunately the data was hugely biased. All the photos of the friendly tanks had one background. All the photos of the enemy tanks had a different background. And they were consistent backgrounds. So it had only bothered to think about the backgrounds. And IBM were talking about a month ago <coughs> in Stockholm about uh, another image recognition training system that was trained to distinguish between wolves and dogs. Except it had the same data bias. Wolves on snow, dogs on grass. So when it was shown a wolf on grass, it was obviously a dog because it was grass. It didn't know about the creatures, it only knew about the background. Or Joy Brulamini. PhD student from, I think, MIT some years ago. You can see her TED talk about this. She was using a vision system to welcome her when she walked into her office and stood in front of her camera. And it was supposed to say, welcome, Joy. Except she discovered it couldn't see her. There was no face in the picture. Her face, as you can see, is a fairly dark colour. And even today, the standard 
trained vision systems cannot detect black, dark black faces, male or female. They are still trained on a set of data of 100,000 cut photos, of which 75% are male Caucasian. So most of us here are okay. The 25% or so uh, Caucasian females are also pretty okay. Now, you've all got biometric passports, I guess, if you finish. And you go through the biometric camera thing. And you put it in. Oh, try again. Try again. Okay. Now, that is an even more interesting one. That shows that it is 35% accurate, on my experience, roughly. And that is matching the photo of my face that it's capturing there with a biometric face on my passport. You would have thought that would have been 100% accurate. It's easy, you would have thought. But it's only about 30% accurate. Some people are lucky and you go straight through. Many people are not. You know, I learn fairly quickly. I take my glasses off even before I get there. Face recognition can be as good as 50, 60, 70. So I've seen a, an example where it was 100% with 20 people walking across the stage, and I presume the database of photos was 20 photos. That's not likely to work. Crown Plaza, 400 rooms, 800 people. Even if it was 99% accurate, that's eight people a day at a minimum, will have a problem. Not good enough. Two sets of training, one to detect in China, a small, relatively small sample size. They were good enough to get 90% accuracy on were people criminal or not criminal or of criminal intent. The other one on the right hand side was gay or straight from a whole load of self-declared photos. I had five photos for each person training up and they got as good as 91% accurate with males gay or straight, and 83% uh, accurate for women in gay or straight. As a technical challenge, those numbers are really quite good, quite impressive. But as an implementable system on the borders, and I can think of various countries who might well be interested in one or both of those to uh, prevent access, that is far, far too low a level of accuracy be useful. It is not ethical to implement systems where you know that some people are going to be um, disadvantaged. And in England we have an online uh, application system for passports where you put your photo in and it looks at the photo and says it does or does not meet the criteria, you can't be smiling. Except that of course black African faces tend, people have, tend to have slightly larger lips which this algorithm says is smiling. And they knew that that was happening before they implemented it two and a half years ago. And still, they went ahead and implemented this system which is disadvantaging a significant proportion of British citizens and they knew it before they went ahead. A system which is not accurate enough to be ethical or meet government standards. And we're using these systems now with autonomous vehicles. I was driving up the road in Derby just recently, and 50, 100 metres ahead I could see a lady walking across the road. And I could see, because my eye is far more higher resolution than a car camera, that she was on 10 centimetre spike heels. And when she saw me coming, she started running. Now, Humans understand that running on high heels, spikes 10 centimetre high, is not the safest thing in the world. So I slowed down, just in case she fell off her heels, which is quite possible. My daughter falls off her heels because um, she likes that sort of Sometimes has a problem. The AV systems cannot detect that. Even if they could be trained, that involves higher resolution than their capability. They can produce a box around a person. They can produce a little box around a uh, banana, as we saw earlier on today. That little tiny hole under a foot. Some more technologies which weren't on the Bernard Marr list. Digital twins, blockchain, quantum computing. Digital twins, well, 
what we've been doing in aerospace, for engine condition monitoring for 50 years. There's nothing new about it. And those models get more and more complex. The jet engines going across the Atlantic generate a terabyte of data per engine, per flight across the Atlantic, which is compared with a digital twin of the engine to identify components which are needing predictive maintenance in the future. No problem. We can do that. But do we want to digital twin everything? How far can we go? What's the questions we need to ask about, is it sensible to, while well, we're doing a digital twin of the engine and some of the aerodynamic side uh, of the aircraft, do we need to also digitally twin all of the uh, seat back locks? Because if the seat won't lock forward, it's a flight safety critical, you can't go. And an author, someone I was reading about recently was saying, I would delay, I needed predictive maintenance on that lock. They should have sorted it before my flight got stopped. stopped. Probably too much data, too many sensors, not cost effective. But blockchain is probably my biggest bet noir. They tell us it will solve every possible problem on the earth with our systems. And here is a list of everything you can possibly do with blockchain, they say. But blockchain is the most magical system there is because it is the only IT system which is not scalable. Every other system we know about, we can throw more compute power to get more throughput, to handle more data. With blockchain, the design sets the throughput. The fastest one we know of today is the hyperledger fabric, which in a natural environment is rounded on one CP, one processing cluster will manage something of the order of 15 or 1,000 transactions a second. And with a little bit of help and tuning, you can possibly get it up to closer to 20,000 transactions a second. That's a change in the software. However many processes, however much processing power you throw at it, it will never be able to go faster because of the way the blockchains work. Databases, we can get them up to the hundreds of thousands of transactions a second if we need to. Amazon, uh, MasterCard, Visa, Amex, their systems are currently tuned to roughly 25,000 transactions a second. And those 75,000 transactions a second roughly keep the financial world, the West at least, running comfortably for payments. Blockchain, a single blockchain can never achieve that sort of speed. So you need to think a little bit about the speed, but you also need to ask much more fundamentally what are the human factors, issues, that are causing the problems in all of those industry sectors there that they claim they will be able to solve? Because it turns out that most of the problems in all of those sectors are nothing to do with the IT. They are to do with our processes, our organizational structures, the working practices, and human, both human fallibility and human, shall we say, inventiveness that will circumvent almost all of the claimed security improvements. So challenge, ask the question. So quantum computing is sold to us as being another magical thing. It's good for a couple of things at the moment. Whether it will develop be good for anything else is yet to be proven. It's because of the fundamental analog nature the fuzziness of quantum computing, that it may not be useful for very much use for anything else other than the two things uh, mentioned there. The message is for those of you in financial services and those of you who are GDPR compliance, interested in data, uh, encryption of data at rest and in motion, you need to start thinking fairly urgently about replacing your current quantum um, cracker ball systems like RSA256 and so on, with some of the very small number of quantum resistant uh, and, uh, algorithms are available today. Because if you don't change soon, any data still encrypted with RSA256 and its little ilk will become crackable with quantum in 5, 10, 15 years. You see, all of these technologies, all nine of those that I've got there, are ultimately solutions looking for problems. Oh, yeah, and you are not getting the reward. The vendor
vendors and the developers are getting the reward from you. You need to do what's done at the bottom. Understand the problem first. Find potential solutions, process and IT, and then look for solutions and technologies. And here are the six W's. What, how, why, where, when, who. They will give you the entry to all the, or the answers to all the questions you need to know. There's a couple of frameworks which will implement that for you, but the thing to remember is this. Start with your business situation and your problem. Work out what the solution is and then look for technologies that will actually deliver part or all of what you want. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Richard. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the questions, but if you have something on your mind, you can contact Richard afterwards also, and I'm sure that he's uh, happily answering you.